Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today I have a very interesting and terrifying upload to share with you all. Before we get into it, though, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch store to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and my PayPal are in the description below. My merch is displayed directly under this video. Also, Dogman, Frightening Encounters, Volume 1, 2, and 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeffrey Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description below. Now, everyone, I have taken far, far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload. Shall we? Today's first part of the upload. Now, I've never shared this with anyone up until now. I live in an area of North Carolina that back in the early 1800s had the largest sawmill in the United States at the time. The town of Elizabethtown now sits on those grounds of that sawmill. To the north is Bladen Lake State Forest. There's a creek there called Turnbull Creek, named after the Native American chief that laid claim to the land there. My grandfather told me that Chief Turnbull struck a deal with the sawmill and allowed them to cut the trees except in one area, where many of their ancestors were laid to rest. The story goes that the loggers began cutting and for years no problem had ever come between the loggers and the tribe, until the day they decided to cut on sacred land. A battle broke out and in the end the tribe was slaughtered all except for the chief. It is said he cursed the land and swore to protect it forever. It is said he changed into a black smoke as dark as coal, and in it was two bright red eyes like fire. The story told in that detail would scare any kid from venturing off into those woods, except for myself and my best friend. In my younger years, I loved to explore, so naturally those woods made a great place to have adventures and discovery. The creek always gave relief. From the hot summer days, the cool water fed by the springs was so cold in the heat it would give you goosebumps. I used to think there was gold in the water from the glittery flakes you would find all over your skin after a dip in the tea-colored waters. You always had to be careful of where you took a swim because cottonmouths, water moccasins, and rattlesnakes enjoyed its banks. The forest around it was loaded with wildlife. Deer, black bear, raccoon, and squirrel could be seen daily. Sometimes, if you were lucky, you would find an arrowhead or an old railroad spike from the old logging rail that went down the side of the creek. The old dirt road to the creek was a good hour walk from the neighborhood. I remember one spot on the road was always cold, even in the summer. So cold, in fact, we would run as fast as we could to get through it. Sometimes it felt like the temperature would drop from 99 degrees to 50 right there. Eventually, I got curious as to why. Maybe it's another creek that nobody knew about, or a pond filled with fish, or maybe something else. Whatever it was, I was going to find out. One June, me and my best friend set out to find out. My grandfather told us not to, and told me the story of Chief Turnbull. I wrote it off as an old tale to scare kids, and set off into the woods. I never believed in ghost stories, and this one wasn't going to scare me off as well. I told my best friend to be prepared for my grandfather to try to scare us, and we went off. I remember walking forever through those woods and never finding anything, so we decided to follow the cold air and see where it went. After some time passed, we came up to a thick area in the woods. Thorny vines, thick underbrush was everywhere. The cold air was coming from inside of this thicket. We found what we thought was a deer trail, and crawling on our hands and knees, we made our way through it. It felt like a hundred feet we crawled before everything cleared out. No trees, no brush, just tall grass and mounds of dirt scattered about. 
and the air was freezing cold. The whole clearing was surrounded by the thicket like a ring. The air was misty like a light morning fog. In the middle of the clearing was what looked like smoke from a campfire. It was a dark smoke, and it was what looked like a person standing there. All I could see was the outline of a body, but when it turned, I saw its eyes, bright red like fire. It moved toward us quicker than we could react. When we did react, we moved like lightning had struck us on our feet. I never knew a person could run on all fours, but we did that day. Right back through the thicket so fast it seemed like a flash. Behind us, we could hear something stomping through the woods like a charging bear and people whispering in our ears. We made it out of the thicket and never stopped running. We ran until the air warmed up and we couldn't breathe enough air in. I think it stopped chasing us long before we stopped because we didn't hear it anymore. But why not be a little safe and make sure? When we made it out of the woods, it was starting to get dark. No words spoken on that walk home. Just two kids trying to make sense of what happened in our heads. We walked by his house first, and mine was a block away. I had to walk past my grandfather's house to get home. He was sitting on the front porch when I walked by. He asked me if we found what we were looking for, and I told him yes. He asked if I wanted to show him with a smile, in which I replied no. The next day, I went back to my grandfather's house. He told me how he did the same thing when he was little as well, how he saw the clearing in the mounds. He said it chased him out of there as well. These woods hide many dark secrets, and that is just one of them. I remember him saying my best friend and I drifted apart after that. He never spoke to me about it, and I never spoke to him about it. He is now the chief of police in a town close by, and I work for an engineering firm building roads and bridges. Stepson came to me not long ago and asked if we could go for a ride to the road one night and spot some deer. I told him, Go if you want to, but I'm not. These woods hide many dark secrets, some you don't want to discover. Sometimes I ride by that dirt road. Sometimes I'll look down it. Sometimes I see a smoky figure standing there with glowing red eyes looking back at me. When I do, I know Chief Turnbull is still there, and he's still protecting that sacred land. He won't have to protect them from me, though. I'm never going back. Now, you will recall my grandfather telling me that the woods hide many dark secrets. This is another one. It was also a story covered by a monster quest a few years ago. So if you want to watch that started at all, I recommend you go and watch it first. I'm going to tell you a story he told me that happened only a few months ago. In a town of Bladenboro, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I live, it is said a demon cat from hell used to stalk the woods, killing livestock and making locals scared. Then suddenly it disappeared. That's what they all said anyway. We know it did not. To this day, there is reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion with blood-red eyes and fur black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it only has a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you there have been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the story, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Bladenboro. Like most, I think, it goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp Area, which covers three counties and 1,225 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day in the green swamp when it started to get dark. If you hunt in this area, you know you got to be out of those woods before dark by law. So he climbed down his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush 
to where he had parked his truck. Now my friend is a cornbread-fed southern boy and has the size to prove it. Standing 6'6 and weighing 260 of pure farm muscle, he is not small by any standards. So he learned not to be scared of anything. He said what happened next made him never want to go into the swamp hunting again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said it sounded like a large black bear, so he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him very nervous because whatever it was knew he was there and wouldn't run off. He said he started making noise and even shot his shotgun into the air. It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl he said you could feel as much as you could hear. All the way through the woods, it stayed just behind him, right out of sight. When he came out of the woods onto the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided it was a pretty good chance that whatever it was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him there, so he took off running. It started to run as well. He said it sounded like a bulldozer crashing through the woods, and when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling in its breath. He didn't have to look back to know that it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him, hoping it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he must have hit it because it screamed, and for a moment he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said it was jet black, as big as a 600-pound black bear with a tail as long as its body, and its eyes were glowing red. He hit it, it was just standing there looking at him, as if to say, now you've done it. He bolted to his truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked and it was right there. He said it was so close, its breath was fogging up the windows. By now, he said he was shaking badly, and it was everything he could do to get his key into the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-350 four-wheel drive that's raised up, so there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing on all fours was looking at him, eye to eye, in his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched him drive off. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns to look around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knew he had shot it. And there were paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that was nine feet up with claw marks one inch deep in the woods spaced four inches apart. They did not venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and did not want to stick around to find out by what. They got back into their truck, and that's when they heard it. A scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was like a woman screaming bloody murder. It let him know it was there and waiting. Yep, there's many dark secrets in these woods. Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come down to Green Swamp. And when the sun goes down, it gets really quiet. You may hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by, because if it is, well, it might be just the last sound you ever hear. Crazy thing is that um, song that Charlie Daniels wrote is called The Legend of Wooly Swamp. That was one of my favorite songs when I was a little kid. I used to put the record on my mom's old hi-fi and jam out to it and sing word for word but I wanted to see and look it up and sure enough it was 
While searching for ideas, Charlie Daniels reminded himself of Woolly Swamp, an actual place in Bladen County, North Carolina, where he used to hunt at night as a youngster, recalling how swamps can take on a whole different personality at the night. The song tells of a man after hearing a fable about a ghost in a place called the Woolly Swamp stubbornly decides to confirm the story on his own, only to come away with the knowledge of it that there are things in this world that you can't just explain. These words are repeated in the chorus between the two verses. The first verse tells of Lucius Clay, who lived in Woolly Swamp, a darkened place back in the swamp called Booger Woods. Clay was an elderly recluse and a miser who cared about his money and kept it in mason jars where he lived. The second verse introduces the Cagle Boys, three sinister white trash brothers who lived in nearby Carver Creek. One night the older brother decides they are going to kill Lucius Clay and steal his money. The three meet up later in Woolly Swamp sneak up to the shack and find Clay with a shovel and 13 rusty mason jars he dug up. The three young men beat Clay unconscious and kill him, throwing him in the swamp, laughing as they watch his body sink into the mire. They grab his money from the shack and try to escape only to become trapped in quicksand. And they can hear a rever reverberated boom and hear Clay's laughing. Now, as many of you know, there is in Bladenboro, North Carolina, a creature called the Beast of Bladenboro. I know a woman who is a retired sheriff who, she was hurt on the job. She was involved in a car accident and now became a animal control officer. And she has searched little parts of this swamp, all over actually the swamp, looking for the creature. And for those of you who are not familiar with the beast of Bladen Burrow, well, let me share with you that story. To the European settlers, North Carolina was a mystery before it was much else. In 1587, off the eastern shore of what would become the Tar Heel State, the English attempted their first permanent North American colony on Roanoke Island. No one knows what happened to it. Within a few years, the island's 118 settlers had vanished, leaving behind only a single word carved into a fort gatepost, Croton. When North Carolina became its own colony in 1725 and inherited the legend of the lost colony and the questions that came with it, did the settlers starve, die of exposure, get attacked by Spanish settlers to the south, get attacked by the local Croton tribe, or perhaps integrate peacefully with them? The answer is still far from known, but new evidence is being unearthed. Last year, archaeologists with the North Carolina-based First Colony Foundation discovered pottery shards they believe belonged to some of the lost colonists. This year, they plan to dig more. Some of the state's unexplained legends, from a vampiric beast in the east to the barren wooden circle in the Piedmont to the strange light orbs out west, are grounded in real events, real people, real silence, and, in some instance, real answers that are still being uncovered today. But, don't fret if you're a mystery lover. Even the best modern explanations leave plenty of questions. Beast of Bladenboro. By the time the creature attacked its first human, the residents of Bladenboro were already shaken. For a better part of a week, they had kept off the streets and bolted their doors as vigilant hunters toting large guns poured into their sleepy textile town. Posses. A hundred strong outnumbered the townspeople as they searched to find and kill what appeared to be a demented creature roaming a specific nook of southeastern North Carolina. 
For two weeks near the start of 1954, the town of Bladenboro was a frenzy. An animal was reported to be draining the blood of neighborhood animals. Eight dogs, a family of kittens, and at least one lamb were said to have fallen victim. According to Bladenboro Police Chief Ray Fors, one dog was discovered mangled and lifeless with only a few drops of blood. Another dog, while assisting a group of 500 men on a hunt for the creature, was reportedly dragged into a nearby swamp screaming. Eyewitness accounts state the beast's description as a three-foot-long feline weighing 90 pounds. Some say it sounds like a baby crying. Others compare it to the noise of a woman's shrieks. Theories of the identity of a mad wolf, mountain lion, wildcat, panther, bobcat, spotted leopard, or rabid dog. Authorities found two sets of tracks near where the animal appeared to have struck, leading them to believe that this vampire beast had a mate. Then on the night of January 4th, the beast struck its first and only human, a pretty 21-year-old mother, Mrs. Charles Kinlaw. Though startled, Miss Kinlaw escaped unharmed. The next day, police chief said the town of 790 people was, a quiet, was quiet as he had ever known it. The paper called the period a five-day reign in terror. The effort to bring the beast to bay was a regional affair. Armed fraternity brothers from UNC traveled two hours south to partake in the hunt. Tracking dogs were brought in from Wilmington to the east. At one point, the area reported had somewhere between eight to 1,000 hunters. The town was armed to the teeth. Bladenboro Mayor Bob Fussell later recalled to the Greenville News, even small boys carried guns. Chief of Police Ray Fors, and I knew someone would surely be shot accidentally. News of the vampire beast of Bladenboro was widespread, appearing in newspapers from California to Massachusetts. In an editorial equated the terror of the animal, another menace visited upon locals that prior year, the Ku Klux Klan, the beast of Bladen has been striking at night. Others against other animals that are comparatively defenseless against its attacks. Its tactics resemble those of the Ku Klux Klan, which also prefer to strike at night, overpowering defenseless victims with force of numbers and weapons. Which back in the 50s, that's absolutely stupid. Why would you compare a creature to the Ku Klux Klan? I mean, yes, they're both terrifying, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess in the 50s, you're going to going to kind of see a, a similarity between the two. But what? Anyway, in mid-January, the shooting of a local bobcat tempered local residents concerned. And by the month's end, reports of animal attacks had faded away. Residents today still pass on that story though many suggest much of the hubbub was due to the case of fake news, Mayor Fuzzle would later acknowledge the animal was about 90% imagination, 10% truth. It was he who notified the press about the series of suspicious dog attacks, a tip that morphed into a legend. Kimberly Eng View, an animal professor, of North Carolina State University said many big cat people speculated about 1954 cougar mountain lion panthers don't exist in rural areas near North Carolina's coast. Today, the town hosts the annual Beast Fest in honor of its most famous myth. This year's opening ceremonies fell on the day before Halloween. Don White, president of the Boost of Borough organization, that hosts the festival, was born a year before the beast mania unfolded. Though he was raised hearing tales of the beast, he admits he doubts the veracity of the legend. I think it's more of a promotional gimmick than anything else. Truth be told, he said, but there are people today who claim their brothers, fathers, aunts, uncles remember it vividly, and the accounts 
of the Beast of Bladenboro did not end in the 50s. There are still people around now who still claim to see this beast. Now, I've always, well, not always, but for a long time been fascinated with that legend. But is it really a legend? Is it a myth? I mean, people say the dog man is, but we know it exists. And to me, if you look at pictures of this beast of Bladenboro, the Bladenboro beast, what have you, to me, it looks, yeah, it does look strikingly similar to a dog man with a shorter snout. Um, I really, really feel that the Beast of Bladenboro is a dog man. Uh, if not a dog man, something closely related to it. Um, who knows what it is? But we're talking about something that is very cunning and very smart. Obviously, it's smart if it just disappears into the, the swamp. But there's too many references throughout history for this thing not to be real. You know, it's just... Uh, I don't know. I just, I really feel like with all the accounts and all the things that are going around and, you know, celebration of the Beast of Bladenboro, they have Ruger Rufus in Louisiana. Um, so to me, the creature is real. And prior to me sharing the newspaper article about the Beast of Bladenboro, you heard two very similar encounters that one guy's grandfather shared with him. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. It's crazy. It's scary. It's definitely a place I want to visit, though. It really is. I want to check that place out. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Um, I want to thank you for all of your support. You guys really make this channel what it is. And with that, I urge you to be kind to everyone around. There's enough BS going on in the world. We might as well not be a part of it, right? With that, I hope the Great Spirit watches over all of us and guides us through our path in life. With that, my friends, farewell until tomorrow.